Because market prices are always fluctuating, inflation can be difficult to measure. We are trying to measure an increase in the average price of things, and so that forms the foundation of our approach. Here is an example. Let's say that the only goods and services consumed in our whole economy was three apples, one Apple computer, and internet services. What we could do is track the prices of these things over time. For example, in the first year, the price of the apples might be $1 each. The price of the computer might be $1,500, and the price of a year's worth of internet service could be $1,200. To compute our price level, we would take the average of these prices. So we add them together, one plus one plus one, plus 1,500 plus 1,200, and then we divide by the number of things, which is five. And that gives us an average price of $540.60. Then we would look and see what the prices are next year. Let's say that apples went up to $1.25 each. The computer is now $1,800, and internet, let's say, goes down in price to $1,150. Now the average price of these things is $590.75. Even though internet service is cheaper, the average price has gone up 9.3%. And so we would say this small economy has experienced 9.3% inflation, which is pretty high. This is nice and easy for a fake economy with only five things. But for the real economy, we have millions of people all buying different things from millions of goods and services. So how do we do it? The most common approach and the main approach in the US is to build what we call a consumer price index. The consumer price index or CPI tracks the prices for the basket of goods consumed by the typical urban family of four. They look at the typical things consumers in urban areas are buying, and then they compute a weighted average of all of those prices based on how big a slice they are of the budget of a typical family of four. The CPI is also indexed to a starting point or base year. In the US, our CPI is indexed to the base years of 1982 through 1984. That means the price level over that time period is normalized to 100. So they calculated the average prices, and let's say it was $1,280. This isn't the actual number, but just an example. And then they normalize this to be 100, which means they divide by the same 1,280 and then multiply by 100. So in the end, the consumer price index for the base years is 100. Then in 1985, they check the same prices again. And if they found the numbers added up to $1,377.28, they would again divide by the base year number of 1,280 and multiply by 100. And so the CPI this time would be 107.6. Then they do it again in 1986, where they just normalize the values to those base years. The upside of doing things this way is that the CPI value reported is a lot easier to work with and interpret. I can tell by just looking that prices in 1987 were 13.617% higher than they were in the base years. The CPI is not without issues though. First, we have to use the same exact basket of goods and services over time. When brand new products are introduced, there's no previous prices to compare them to. So we have no way to tell if the price is higher or lower than it would have been last year. 
This leads to some bias in the calculation of inflation. One source of bias is that the CPI does not reflect how consumers substitute one good for another when prices change. The CPI might look and see that beef is getting more expensive, and so the average price of food will be going up. But consumers will probably choose to eat less beef if the price is rising, eating chicken or pork or going vegetarian instead. For this reason, CPI might overstate inflation. Another source of bias is that the CPI cannot include brand new goods. Consider how much cheaper it has gotten over the past couple decades to take a picture of something. You used to have to buy an expensive camera and film and have the picture developed at a lab, but these days the cameras come attached to our phones and you don't need to develop them. The CPI has no way of really measuring how that price is going down for people. So again, this means the CPI probably overstates inflation. And the last bias I'll mention is that the CPI doesn't account for changes in quality. Cars have gotten a lot more expensive over time, but they have also gotten a lot safer. They get better gas mileage and they're more comfortable to drive in. The CPI only sees rising prices. It doesn't measure that increase in quality. So all three of these sources of bias lead economists to believe that the CPI will typically overstate inflation. A second source of problems for the CPI is that it weights the basket of goods it tracks based on the budgets of a typical urban family of four. And so the CPI might overstate or understate the impact of inflation is having on other groups, such as people living in rural or suburban areas, or people who are not living in a family of four, such as single parents, young professionals, or retirees. Many different versions of the CPI have been developed which focus on these different groups. Others, like core CPI, try to strike a different balance with the basket of goods and services which is tracked. Core CPI follows the same basket as regular CPI, but omits food and energy costs. Those two categories in particular tend to have very volatile prices, and abrupt changes in them due to supply and demand factors can overwhelm the regular CPI measure. Most economists believe that core CPI represents a better picture of the true inflation the country is experiencing, though it still suffers from many of the same issues. Another important price index is called the producer price index. This works almost the same way as the consumer price index, but instead it tracks the cost of materials needed for production. The PPI is important for getting a sense of what businesses are facing when it comes to inflation. Last, we have the GDP deflator. The GDP deflator uses the whole set of goods and services produced to measure inflation. So it tracks the change in prices of all goods and services from one year to the next. But if there are any new goods and services, it will just use the new prices for that year. That means that the basket of goods is allowed to change from year to year, solving a lot of the problems faced by the CPI. For this reason, many economists prefer the GDP deflator. You can see here these four main measures of inflation. As we would have predicted, the GDP deflator shows less inflation than the CPI, and core CPI is a bit more stable. We can also see that the producer price index is a lot more volatile than the others. Measuring inflation is a tough business, but it is a critical step in identifying which changes in the economy are real and which ones are just due to inflation.